Summit uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, Amy in, uh, in Concordia, Missouri, and Rich out of St. Louis. So it's great to have everybody here today and all of you that have joined in with us. It's wonderful to, uh, to have you on our webinar today. Just a couple of housekeeping things. If you have any questions for Rich during our, our presentation, if you could type those over in the chat section, that'd be great. We'll get to you as soon as we, uh, as we open up the question and answer time, which will be coming at the end. And there you go, Amy. Thanks for reminding them where that's at. And uh, why don't we just get started with a word of prayer? Gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and the wonderful opportunity you have in this upcoming Advent season, this period of waiting, uh, when we don't just wait to uh, to celebrate Christmas with presents and food and all the trappings that go with it, but we await the coming Christ who came as that baby born in Bethlehem and who we are waiting uh, for whom we are waiting to return. Lord, we pray that you would bless our time today in this webinar and that it might be a blessing to us so that we might be a blessing to others. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. And with that, I'll turn things over to Rich Corris from Lutheran Hour Ministries. Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to Christmas Outreach, uh, the webinar. Uh, my name is Rich Corris, and I was born rich. And as you can see on the screen, the handsome came later. And uh, my name is spelled C-O-H-R-S. If my daddy would have known how to spell, uh, I might be in Denver, and I might be able to provide uh, uh, beverages for all the Lutheran gatherings that we have. As we're waiting for the PowerPoint to come up, I want to start a little bit about my story. I was born and raised in the Chicago area and decided to become a Lutheran school teacher. So I went to River Forest and graduated in 1971. And because I had worked in the urban setting, I'd been in Chicago, I'd been in New York City, um, I requested that I would go to the urban setting and God in his infinite wisdom sent me to New Minden, Illinois. Uh, it was a two-room school, and the population of my apartment building was greater than the county. So I learned an awful lot about rural ministry those first couple of years. And then God sent me to another rural area, which I didn't think there was anything smaller than New Minden, but there was, and it was called Horse Prairie. At the time, the population was 20, and then I had a daughter, so it went up to 21. And then from Horse Prairie, um, finally moved to uh, kind of a larger area, went to Wichita Falls, Texas, and it was at Wichita Falls, Texas that I learned how to say y'all, because uh, I like y'all. Uh, y'all is a good word, and, and I like y'all too, But and I know the plural of y'all is all y'all, but I would show you a picture of my school, but the, the school is gone. After I left, they, they uh, disbanded the school, and so then I took a call to a little place up in the thumb of Michigan, and if you're in Michigan, this is the map of Michigan, and I was way up there and it was called Seawing, Michigan. We had a fairly large school, but it was in a, a very rural environment. Our, our largest industry there was the sugar beets. And I lived next to the sugar beet factory, and I learned to say that that was the smell of money. I want to talk to you a little bit about outreach and the urgency that we have. When I was teaching, I found out that there were days when I was just saying, well, you know, I'm going to do this tomorrow. Um, I found out in September 13th, 2014, that there may not, or well, September 13th, 2014, there may not be a tomorrow. Uh, my wife and I were on a Luther tour. We were in Erfurt, Germany, and we had just left the um, monastery where Martin Luther had fallen on the, or laid prostrate on the cobblestones. And I was walking across the street. There you see a picture of the street that I was walking. And I tripped. And when I tripped, you can see where the uh, ambulance is, where those train tracks are. I fell onto the train track, and I shattered my shoulder into about, um, they said, 8 to 15 pieces. And so I'm laying on the train track, and, and I knew I was injured. and. I was telling the people not to move me. They moved me. Shortly after that, then the uh, train came by. So it was a matter of two bad choices. Neither one of them would have been very good. So I went in and had surgery the next day. 
And during the surgery then, um, all kinds of complications arose. And so on September 19th, we decided that I needed to go back to uh, St. Louis. The tour was leaving, so there was a lot of a lot of our friends and that could help us as we went. And so on September 19th, I came back to St. Louis. So it was a 14-hour trip. Got off the plane, um, then went right to the hospital. And when I got to the hospital, I found that um, I wasn't doing that well. The uh, the doctors uh, said that my kidneys had failed. Um, I would, I electrolytes were gone. The uh, he said that I was very fortunate not to have a heart attack. Um, they really couldn't find a blood pressure. When they finally found one, it was like 47 over 41. Uh, so I spent a couple days in the ICU, and I came out, and I came out with a desire that all people should know Christ, and they should know Him today. And I shouldn't waste time thinking about, well, what should I say? I should just say something. And so it's it's kind of like ever since then, it's been, I uh, do know Jesus. Um, Amy, we're going to push on with the slides. And now we get to Christmas. And the Christmas time, the uh, next slide. There you go, the Christmas time. Uh, that is a picture of the um, Silent Night Chapel outside of Frankenmuth. The Christmas time is a time where the world takes time to celebrate giving. And what a great gift that we've been given through the gospel. When I was in the hospital in Erford, I was having all kinds of experiences and nightmares, and one of which was I, I literally and virtually saw hell. I mean, it was it was a, it was a scary, very scary experience. But then later on, I was experiencing the gospel light coming and enveloping me with the peace and the hope and the comfort and the joy of a free gift of salvation of heaven. And that took away my fear. It took away all of the pain. I was able to rest that night. So as we look at Christmas and we look at the world and how the world looks at Christmas as a time of giving and, and getting gifts, we can talk about the gift of salvation and the world is, is actually helping us do that. We're going to talk about four points. We're going to talk about how we have to know the story, first of all. We're going to talk about the invitation. We're going to tell the story. And we're going to share the story. So we start with knowing the story. And when we know the story, um, the, first, the, the first thing we think of, it comes from Luke chapter 2. And so I have the, I have actually my, the, the Bible that my godmother gave to me when I was in eighth in eighth grade, and it in Luke two, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary as his spouse's wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. That is an awesome story. And when we think about all of the forces that, that were in play at this time, it's just amazing. We talk about Caesar Augustus. We talk about how there was a taxing. We talk about the angel visiting Mary. We talk about Elizabeth and John. It's just, a, it's just a fabulous story. And then after the birth of Jesus, then we hear about the shepherds. And I've had the privilege of being at the shepherd's field. And the next part then talks about how an angel came to approach the shepherds. And when I was there, I was at the shepherd's field in Bethlehem. And you virtually, literally can turn around from the cave where they believe the shepherds were, and you can look up the hill, and you can see into Bethlehem. That was that close. And the angels are saying to them, you know, don't be afraid, because there's a gift that's been born t today in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And you're going to find him, and you're going to see him. And then the multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and glory to God in the highest. What a beautiful story that is. 
I find it always encouraging at the time of Christmas to know that one of the first announcements that came about the birth of the Savior came to shepherds, men out watching their flocks at night, lowly men, not the kings, not the not the not the rich people, but just just people. And I'm always encouraged by the responses as we get in Luke 2 into 15. And they decided, hey, let's go see what's going on. Let's go see what the chef, what the angels are talking about. And they did. They went, they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And they knelt down and worshipped. But what I found fascinating about that is then they couldn't be quiet. They turned around, they walked away, and they started telling the stories of everybody that, of, of Jesus to all that they saw. It is a beautiful story, and if you were like me, you memorized it, you stood up in church and you've spoken it. But there's other things that are behind the story that we don't always see the nuances. Lutheranauer Ministries has what's called the Men's Network. And they also have what's called Stuff They Didn't Teach Me in Sunday School, produced by Bruce Werdeman. Episode 130 is the Christmas story. And in the Christmas story, he takes 10 minutes, and he goes through the birth of Jesus as found in Luke chapter 2. And he makes some observations. He takes us beyond you know, just the Bible story, and he, he helps us get behind some of the in, interesting facts just to flesh out the story. It's not critical to our faith. It's not It's not necessary. But it's just kind of fascinating to see how God works. For example, uh, I mentioned Caesar Augustus, the, you know, one of the most powerful men in the world at the time. And we know from the Old Testament that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. Well, how are you going to get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem? Caesar Augustus is going to give a decree that they should go. How cool is that? I mean, it's just that you, you just see how God is, is working with people. The, the other thing that we have is in the men's network, we have the Bible studies, and it's called Joseph Carpenter of Steel. And this is a four-part story, a four-part study that re, it uses video. Uh, Pastor Seltz is the host of this. There is a video, uh, four, four short videos, and then there's discussion questions about the videos. And it delves into the life of Joseph, and it, and it talks about the character that we don't spend a lot of time on, but it also uh, delves, like stuff they didn't teach you in Sunday school, it delves into the the facts, the issues, the, the culture of the day. What this does is it provides the information in the Bible study, but at the end it has over 50 internet links that give you historical and cultural deta uh, details, things like uh, the, the wise men, Herod the Great, um, you know, the whole lunacy that he had, uh, Caesar Augustus, um, the, the extra stories about Joseph. It, it delves into the story and it goes beyond the story. Uh, another thing, another story that we have at Christmas time that we often don't take a lot of time with is the story of Santa Claus. Um, you know, you know that story. My, uh, my wife works for Macy's, and at this time of year, Macy's has got their their Believe mailbox and so on and so forth, and we all know the miracle on 34th Street and so on and so forth, and the Santa Claus. Well, Pastor Klaus, Pastor Ken Klaus, has put together a one-session Bible study um, called The Real St. Nick. Santa Claus, as you know, came from the tradition of um, um, St. Nicholas, who was a historical character. And this Bible study... It has a, a video, it's about 30, 35 minutes, and it has a discussion guide behind it. And it's one which explains the life of St. Nicholas, explains how he had been persecuted for the faith, explains his place in the faith, and it also sh uh, shares a little bit about his generosity. It tells a story about how there was a, a family and there were daughters. And the daughters... Um, weren't going to get married, and so the only available way that they could make a living was through prostitution. And St. Nicholas saw this, and so what he did is he, he took some gold and he, he 
wrapped it in a sock and he threw it in the window at night and it landed in the living room, I think somewhere like that. And, and the daughters were saved from this life because of his generosity. The the real St. Nick then is, is an interesting study. I have actually taught this class right at Christmas time, right before Christmas, to a to a Sunday school class that was all ages. We had children, we had adults, we had grandparents, so on and so forth. And it's very fascinating to see how St. Nicholas and what we don't know about him and how it comes through today. It's, it's, it's available free for the Men's Network as a download. So once you know the story and you start planning to share the story, to tell the story, what's critical is the invitation. Um, you all know that we're going to have Thanksgiving soon, and my, I'm getting ready. The house is getting ready because my children and grandchildren are coming because I had invited them. Well, what would happen if I had prepared for all of this Thanksgiving meal, but I didn't invite anybody? I mean, who would show up? So we have to start with the invitation, and what we need to start with is something that we're all aware of in churches. We have to use the familiar. The first thing that we have to use is our bulletin announcements. We all have bulletins. We're all used to seeing them. We cannot ignore them, and we need to make sure that we have enough information with enough lead time to share with the congregation members and those that would read the bulletins exactly what it is that we're planning, where we're planning. We have to remember the who, what, where, when, why, and we have to make sure that we cover all of that in our bulletin announcements. One vehicle that we can use is the newsletter, and we, we have more lead time with the newsletter. We also, because most of the time, this is like once a month, and so like for a Christmas activity, you could already start pre preparing that in September and October, and you have a more space to kind of explain more in depth what it is. You also should be able to, to use the spoken announcements um, this is particularly important because most people, I believe, would be like me. We, we read the bulletin, we read the newsletter, we go to church. We don't particularly act because we've got a lot of time. We can we can do this later. But then when pastor says something after the service, it's like, oh yeah, I got to do that. I got to got to get going on this. Um, one suggestion might be, instead of just having pastor make the announcements afterwards, have like the head of the evangelism committee or the person that's going to be responsible for the outreach event, have them make the announcement. And I know a lot of churches do that, and we're all familiar with that, so that's a good thing. And we always need the encouragement for all the members to invite and to attend. Um, I had a school in Texas, like I said, that, that's gone now, but... Out of the 200 and some students that I had, I had like 30 Lutherans. And so what what that meant was, and, and well, in that case, it was, it was because we had a very small Lutheran church anyway, but what the community would look like is they say, well, you have a Lutheran school, but the Lutherans aren't going to it. If you have an event and your church members are not attending, what kind of message is that sending? Besides the familiar, though, you should also look beyond that and use the media. Um, when I was with Lutheran Hour Ministries before, I did a program called Parish Media Team Training, and in that, I was training congregations on how to make news releases. And I found out that one of the best ways to get your announcements out is to make a news story about your outreach events and send it to the shopper's guide or the local newspaper. Uh, when I was in Seedwing, we had the Seedwing Blade Crescent, and their motto was fantastic. You're familiar with the motto of the uh, New York Times. The, the motto is, all the news that's fit to print. Well, the banner on the Sea Wing Blade Crescent said, underneath it, it said, all the news that fits, we print. And so I was able to send them news stories as long as I couched it correctly. I didn't just put in a community invitation to come to my Christmas outreach program. I made it a news story. I found the hook. I found how it impacted the community, um, what was different or unique about it, and I was able then to to uh, share it with the newspaper, and it, it worked. Shoppers guides work very well because, especially at this time of year, as my wife can attest, 
the coupons are very important. And shopper's guides are usually filled with coupons, so a lot of people read that. So if you can get your event placed in a shopper's guide, uh, that would be fantastic. Another media that you might look at is radio stations. Uh, when I was in Michigan and when I was in southern Illinois, we had very small stations that had a very small footprint. And for a very small price, I was able to purchase ads on the radio station. I mean, we, in, we used to call it the dollar a holler station. You know, for a buck, you could get, you know, a 30-second commercial or whatever. And sometimes I was able to, if I had enough lead time, I was able to put it on a community calendar. And so I would have my events on the community calendar. Um, some people talked to me about that and said, well, you know, like in southern Illinois, I had KMOX out of St. Louis that people could read. And I said, you know, I don't want to use KMOX because I can't serve KMOX. KMOX goes to Nebraska, it goes to Iowa, it goes to Texas. I said, I'm in southern Illinois. I'm 50 miles from St. Louis. So I want like WJR or something, something, well, no, not WJR, it would be a big station. I forgot the name of the call letters in Centralia. But it's just a little radio station that just covers the people right where I'm at. And if I could get my announcement on right after they did the hospitalizations and the birth announcements, that was fantastic because then I know everybody heard it. Um, the other thing that you can think about doing is the signs in front of church. I know a lot of times we, we, we tend to ignore that. We have the sign out in front and it, it announces the name of the church and the pastor and so on and so forth. But as we saw in this last political campaign, if we use a lot of those yard signs, if we use a lot of uh, uh, logos, for example, like a Christmas outreach at St. John's, and if we put this out as like a yard sign, it, it, it is unique enough that people will stop and look at it. And so as people travel in front of your church, they're reminded that this is the place where the outreach is going to happen. Another thing that we need to remember to use is the members themselves. One thing that was that I found was very helpful is I would print out invitations and give it to them, um, similar to what you would have like for a for a wedding invitation. You know, you are invited too, and I would print it out. I would I used to use the spirit duplicator, then I used the the copy machine, and I'd give it to the members and I said, you know, please pass these out at your work, at your business, um, your friends, your relatives, whatever. And then that way the the information gets beyond where we're at. Another thing that I would suggest that they do is walk the neighborhood. Invite your neighbors. Um, I'm going to give you a little aside here. It's not the topic, but it is kind of an outreach topic. As you're walking the neighborhood and you're going to invite them to the Christmas outreach, why not, why not stop in front of each of the houses and say a little prayer for the people that are there? Um, you know, just just a little prayer walk and suggest that you know you can do that if you if you encourage your members to call other people then you're using something that uh, they have the whole contact list in their phones they have that personal face-to-face -face invitation which is so critical and you can post you can ask the members to post the flyers the uh, the posters and so on and so forth as they go around the neighborhood. They can put messages in their workplace. Um, I did this for an event that I did in, in one of my schools and I went down to the local gas station. I was like two blocks away and I asked them, could I put a poster there? And they said, sure. So I put it up there and then the the gas station attendant saw it and said, well, you know, I've got a friend that works at the grocery store and we've got the bulletin board. Can I put it there? I said, sure, you can do that. So. If you give them posted or posters or little information things, so just give it to the members so that they can post it around. Now, at Lutheran Hour, we have a daily bulletin, and a lot of the people are putting their messages in, which is great. Uh, you may not be able to do that, but you could put it at where you travel. Um, every now and then, I would go to the local grain elevator, and I'd walk in the office, or I'd go to the feed store, and I'd, I'd see posters up there. And I particularly like the ones about the sausage dinners, but... That's probably not something you're going to do at Christmas. One other thing you can do then is you can distribute the posters then in flyers, but use the internet. The internet is critical as we go through this. You can you can use the internet on your website for your church. I mean, and I think almost all churches have a website now. Put the information on the website. You can do it in email messages. It comes right to the to the members um, inbox. They have the information. They're able then to, to 
to make the invitation. You can put text messages out, uh, particularly for your like your youth group. You can put it on your Facebook page. Um, the Facebook is a tremendous social media, uh, has a lot of power, and so you can put pictures up there. You can put your information on there. You can use Instagram. Uh, Instagram is is becoming more and more popular. Um, you can do it on Twitter. You can do it on Pinterest. And you know, I I am going to lose my man card for saying Pinterest, but I'll say Pinterest. I have a Pinterest page, and I'm not particularly proud of it, but I have one. Another thing that I found early on in my ministry is don't forget the power of the children. What I would do every now and then is if it was like a Christmas outreach program, I would have a color page made. I'd have the kids color it. They would have the information, the who, the what, the when, the where. And then I would have the kids deliver that to whoever they wanted to, grandma, grandma, mom and dad, neighbors, their friends, so forth. When you want to make sure that they all have an opportunity then to invite their circle of friends, because that's very important. They they are really um, social people, and so particularly the teens, they rely on their friends. And you want to make sure that they invite their relatives. I have 12 grandchildren. I've been very blessed, but they all live out of state. I live in St. Louis. They live in Michigan. They live in Denver. But I'm getting invitations to come to their events all the time, which is really kind of cool. Encourage them then to use their social media contacts as they expand the circle, not just for their friends, but then also for their friends' friends. So now you want to tell the story. Tell the story is, this is how you share the story, basically inside your congregation. You're going to invite people to come to your congregation. So the first thing is the children's Christmas service. A lot of churches do it. I, I think almost every, well, every church that I was affiliated with has had that. But then we can also go beyond the children's Christmas service. Um, I've done this a number of times. I've been part of it. Um, some call it different names. One is lessons and carols. One is just Christmas carols. One is a community carol saying, what you do is you come for an afternoon or for an evening, and you just have the familiar Christmas carols. Everybody loves Christmas carols at this time of year, and they never go out of style. I mean, there, there's radio stations on the air right now that have 24-7 Christmas songs. And you invite the people to come, but then you can give them the biblical knowledge behind it. You can say, you know, um, a little town of Bethlehem, and you can read the, the verses behind that. You know, Wayne a manger, what the, the, the whole implication of the manger and the gift of Jesus. Um, and community members will tend to um, come to these type of things because they're not being pressured to come to a worship service. I mean, it could be construed as a worship service, but they're coming just to sing carols. Another thing that you can do is the Christmas concert. Um, I have been involved in lots of different Christmas concerts as an administrator and as a dad. Uh, my children play musical instruments, so at one church we had a Christmas concert where the children all played in the band, and we had a bell choir, we had uh, the flutophones with the little kids, and um, I sang in the choir, so we had a choir concert, and again, it was it was a special night. It was not connected with a worship service. Pastor would open with an invocation and a prayer, we'd have the concert, and he'd close with a, with a prayer and a benediction. Um, and so we were giving the community the message, but we were doing this, you know, using our gifts and talents. One thing I found interesting about the one church I was at is we we did not limit the participation in the Christmas concert just to our members. So we were using community members for the band, and we were using community members for the choir who were not Lutheran, and in some cases they didn't have a faith, and so. After three, four, five years of participating, uh, they were doing it for their musical talent, uh, but they also heard the story, and we know the word does not come back void. And so, after a while, some of these some of these participants then ended up belonging to our church, and the kingdom of heaven was expanded. And it's such a blessing if we can start looking at ways to reach out beyond our own circle. Another thing that we can do is the Advent by candlelight. This has become very popular um, in the last couple of years. I confess I've never been to one. Uh, it's generally for the women. Um, 
I understand that they come in and they have tables and they have candles and so on and so forth. Uh, they do their service. I know one church I was at, uh, the ladies had to outdo each other in their desserts and their cookies and stuff. But Advent by Candlelight is a way that you can invite community members to come to your table and they can hear the story. Um, another one that I've participated in, I haven't, I haven't uh, led it, but I've been part of it, is called the Journey to Bethlehem. Uh, the Journey to Bethlehem is where you, you take the congregation's building, whatever building you've got, um, yeah, I went to a little church in, in Colorado that had it. My my grandchildren were there, and they said, "Grandpa, we got to go to Bethlehem tonight." And I said, "Okay, fine." So they had a like a narthex, a small narthex, and then they have a little fellowship room, and they turned the fellowship room into you know the you know I got to do Bethlehem, um, and they had. Um, you know, people dressed up in robes and so on and so forth. And at the end, you would walk out, and you would have to like uh, uh, see the the census. You'd have to go see the census takers. You were given a coin. You had to walk through there, and you had a scroll. Um, you you were able to buy Bethlehem crafts and so on and so forth. But what was interesting is after you journeyed through Bethlehem and their little room there, then you were ushered out the back door, and you went to what's called a living nativity. Uh, and that was really a lot of fun. They had the, the traditional stable. They had the animals. Um, they had Mary and Joseph. They had a, an infant. I think that the one that I was at, they used a doll because the weather was so cold. It was it was you know minus zero, so they used a doll. But Mary and Joseph, uh, they must have had thermal underwear or something. But they're laying there and. And you had the animals, and I was holding my grandson, and, and what a what a beautiful experience that was. Where he came and he looked at me after he had petted the sheep and he had petted the goats and the ox and so forth, and he came over and he kind of knelt down in front of the the manger and he looked at me and says, "Grandpa, that's Jesus, and Jesus died for our or, yeah, Jesus died for our sins." He was going into the Easter story. I said, "What a great thing that we can have a living nativity." Well, after we tell the story, then it's time to to share the story. Share the story is taking the story outside of your congregation and moving it into the community. And this is, I think, something that we we may or may not do a lot of. The churches that I've visited, I've had the opportunity to visit in many, many churches throughout the Synod. And I walk in, my, my express purpose when walking into a church when I'm alone is to see if I can get in and out within it without anybody talking to me, without making any contact. And for the most part, I can do that. I mean, it's getting better, but uh, I'd say 40% of the time I can get in and out with anybody talking to me. What I do is when I sit down, I'll grab a, a folder, or I'll grab a bulletin, or I'll grab an announcement sheet, whatever they call it, and what I do is I put X's, I box, put a box, it's hard to draw on the skin there, put a box, there we go, put a box, <laughs> you understand. Uh, I put a box around all of the announcements that are designed for the people inside the church. And then I put an X through the announcements that are designed for people in the community. Now, as as predicted, most of the announcements will be for the people inside the church because that's what it's for. But what I found is there's a lot of churches where there's nothing for outside the church. And I believe that what we need to do more of, especially at Christmas time, we need to bring the gift to them. Um, I'll share a little bit about my dream. Uh, when I was in the hospital in Germany, I literally and virtually saw hell. But what happened next is I was laying in the Kidron Valley in in, uh, in Jerusalem, outside of the Temple Mount, and I was laying on, on a tomb. I was stretched across the tomb, and I could not move. All I could do is I could face up, and I could see the Mount of Olives, uh, what's called the Palm Sunday Road. And I'm laying there paralyzed, and I'm paralyzed with fear, with doubt, with despair, with sorrow. And I see this little light, and it comes down the hill, and it comes closer to me, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's laid into my hand, and it's the gospel light. The gospel came to me in my sin, and it, I couldn't do anything. There's nothing I could do 
the gospel came to me and gave me the peace. We need to get out of the community. And we need to bring the gospel to them. One thing that was the most fun that I ever had was the community Christmas carol. We got a group together of about 40 of us, roughly, and we divided us into singing groups. We were given certain uh, assignments. We were to go see some of the shut-ins, which we did, and we were in this, you know, where there's section roads, and so you might have to do 20 minutes to get to the next shut-in, so on and so forth. And so we went around to each of the houses. But then afterwards then, we went into the little town. It wasn't a very big, I mean, our downtown was like two blocks. But we went into the downtown. We went to where the houses were, and we were each given a street, and we just went up and down the street, and we started singing to the houses. Um, it was interesting. It was a lot of fun. Most of the houses uh, were taken aback. They just, they didn't, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? A lot of them were smiles. A lot of them were, you know, come on in and, and have a cup of coffee or come on in and share some wine or whatever. But it struck me that as we were walking the streets, and these are, you know, people that we've seen all the time, the the joy that they had, the tears that they had, because the church came to them it was just amazing. Um, so I suggest that you do that. I live in in uh, St. Louis area, and there's a little town called St. Charles, and they have Dickens characters on Thanksgiving, and they do the, the Christmas carols, and people will stop and sing along. We did a cookie walk. Uh, in my story, I was married for 35 years, and God decided to to take my wife home. And so now I had been single for a while, and it came Christmas time, and I like Christmas cookies. And so what our church did is they got the ladies together, and each of the ladies baked their favorite Christmas cookie. And they put it all out, and for X amount of dollars, you could get a, a bakery box filled with Christmas cookies. So I went around about 17,000 times just to get all of the cookies. And Actually, after the third time, they said I couldn't go back anymore. That was a fantastic thing. Well, then the second, and that was held in our school gymnasium. Well, then I started talking to the per, to the people that were in charge of it. And I said, you know, this is a great thing, and I know that there's other people like me in the community that wouldn't necessarily have Christmas cookies. Instead of doing this in the gym, how about if we go up to the fire hall uh, or the VFW? And so they did. They went out into the community and they, they rented the hall and they they did their cookie walk there for the community. And we were able to put up our church sign. We were able to have the invitations for the Christmas service. And we gave them some really, really good cookies, which was a great thing. Another thing that's very popular at this time of year is the um, craft fairs. Now, I think a lot of those craft fairs have probably already happened just because uh, with each each year, Christmas seems to get, you know, like Halloween becomes Christmas and so on and so forth. The craft fairs we're all familiar with. Uh, generally, the ladies get together and they do some really fantastic crafts. Uh, just the other day, I brought out my cross. Uh, I was at a craft fair at one of my churches and a gentleman had put together stained glass crosses and so I had bought some crosses and so I put them out at Christmas. Um, one thing that I did is I used my Sunday school kids. Um, and it, there was a time when I was a Sunday school superintendent. What I did is I used my Sunday school kids, and I started about in September. And I went to like Scholastic Arts and other companies like that, and I found some very small, easy to make craft kits. And we started making some Christmas crafts. We made snowflakes, we made Christmas trees, so on and so forth. And then I looked around, you know, and talked to the ladies that do the crafts, and I found like um, some of you may remember the Reader's Digest. You fold them over, and then you spray them, and then you make Christmas trees. So I did that with the kids, and then I had all of the. So I would have like 15 or 20 of each of these crafts, and then I would have a craft fair, and on, along with the adult crafts, then I would have the children's crafts, and that was so fun to see. The children would stand there, they would. They would uh, share the story of Jesus. They would share the Christmas story. But then they were also so proud to be able to say, you know, I made that. Um, and besides, a lot of the grandmas and grandpas paid big bucks for that anyway. So 
I, it's not a bad thing. Another thing that you can use at this time would be the uh, daycare for Christmas shoppers. Um, and that's not really the name for it, but it's the only name I could come up with. Um, you open up your, your facilities and you make it available to the community. And in today's world, I know you have to worry about things like uh, you know, background checks and so on and so forth, but you do that. You know, you, you make yourself legal. You provide a, a, an afternoon or a day where moms and dads can drop the children off and then they can do Christmas shopping. It gets really, really hectic to be able to just go to the mall. And like where I lived, to go to the mall was an hour and 15 minutes. And so you did that, you know, like once a quarter. Um, and so if I wanted to buy Christmas presents for the kids, I, I really couldn't bring them, but then one of us would have to stay home. And so my church's youth group provided this where I could drop the kids off. And it was it was a great experience for the kids. It was a great experience for us. Uh, my wife and I were able to actually have lunch and do shopping together. It was fantastic. Well, while we were there at the mall, we found that there was another church that had a table set out that would do the wrapping. Uh, that was fantastic. Now at that time, I didn't think much of it. But later on, after my wife had passed away, I'm at the, I'm at the same mall and I'm doing the, the Christmas shopping and I see this church and um, I have all these presents and I thought, you know, this is a great thing. So I don't even remember whatever the cost, I think it was just for donations. I left my presents there. They were all wrapped up. They were wrapped up very nice. They did a great job. And it's a service. Well, I had the opportunity then to start talking with them about, you know, the, the question that I asked is the one that is always the best question to get. It's like, why are you doing this? And their answer was because, you know, this is a time where we give to one another just like God gave Jesus to us as our Savior. Um, so, I mean, it... I don't know if that would be available at where you're at, um, but I also know that it doesn't always have to be at a mall. Um, and when I lived in, in Michigan, they had Jackie's Country Flowers, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, she would have a, a Christmas day. Well, they had a little booth in the corner, a little card table, and her kids would sit there, and as a service uh, for people that shopped at her store, they would wrap the presence there, and I thought, well, that's kind of nice, you know. And so, your members might have connections where you could go to a, an establishment and you could do that present wrapping for them. Uh, another thing that that I did, I did it a couple times. Um, the company that I used is no longer there, and I just did a Google. It's called a, a, a children's Santa store, and this was more for the preschool children, uh, you know, like ages six on down. And when I was a child, I'd go up to the Ben Franklin and I would get, you know, mom the, the little 10 cent bottle of lavender water and I'd go home and dad give me some wrapping paper and I'd wrap it and I'd make a tag to mommy from Ricky and, you know, and she made a big deal out of it. Children like the concept of being able to give gifts, but not always do they have an opportunity then to get something that they can either afford or that would be, you know, appreciated. These commercial companies provide a way where the children can come in, they can shop for the gifts. They're, you know, obviously they're inexpensive, but they're meaningful. Um, I still have a little gift that one of my children gave to me when they were very little, and I'll, I'll treasure it because it's not the quality of the gift, it's, it's, it's from my child. Um, so if you look at this, you might want to do this, but if you do it, I would really suggest that you make it available not just to the people in your congregation, but you promote it to the community. And again, that, that's how you make a news story. Uh, this becomes a newsworthy event because, you know, you're, you're appealing to the children, you're appealing to uh, the uniqueness of them having their own special store, you're providing a service for the community. But then you also have that opportunity then to share the story as the children come in. You can share the story of Jesus and his love. Um, another thing that you can do is the giving trees. 
Um, I've seen lots of variations of them, and you probably have one set up in your congregation too. I encourage you to do that if you haven't done that. Um, one of the most uh, meaningful ones that I saw was a giving tree that was specifically designed for young uh, women who had children out of wedlock, and they were looking for things like diapers and bottles and so on and so forth. And I said, you know, what a what a challenge these young ladies face in our society and what a way for the church to reach out for them um, and to provide some of their their needs at this time of year. Um, there are other types of giving trees. There's ones where you can do it for congregation members that may have fallen on hard times. There may be for the community uh, where you know that the children are are not going to receive presents. I did a variation like that after Hurricane Katrina. I was principal in Michigan. And what I did is I sent a letter out to all of the schools in Michigan asking them to, asking their children to send me Christmas presents that they would like. And so we got a truckload of Christmas presents that these kids would like. I got a, um, a company to donate the shipping and a company to donate wrapping paper and ribbons and then we drove it down to the church in New Orleans after Katrina and we were able to provide a store where the parents that were still there were able to provide a Christmas for their children. It seems commercial and yet what a great way it is for the parents to share the, the whole concept of the, the season with their children. And while I was there, one of the children asked me that question, you know, why are you doing this? And I said, well, the children up in Michigan um, heard about what was happening here, and they really wanted to help you because Jesus has given so much to us, and they, God has given so much to them that they want to share with you. And this young man looked at me, and he was very moved, and he said, where's Michigan? It's like he, he, he just couldn't conceive of people from a state far away that would reach out with a giving gesture to him. So the more that you can get into the community with these kind of gestures, uh, it's just an awesome thing. Another thing that we can do at this time is the food distribution. Um, I talked to a pastor from Popper Bluff, Missouri, and uh, we, we were at a conference together. And at this time of year, what he does is he collects names of people from the community, people from the congregation that could benefit from a food distribution. He, he talks to certain people in his congregation who have a heart for giving, and they provide boxes of food. And it's, it's not just your typical you know, turkey dinner for Thanksgiving or your, your, your ham dinner for Christmas or whatever. What he's doing is providing uh, a significant quantity of the staples, the, the canned goods and so on and so forth. Um, and then he brings it to the families. And as he's doing this, uh, we started we started discussing it, and he said, you know, it, it, it's a great thing, and gets lots of feedback. But then, as we started looking at it, I said, well, do you have any leave behind pieces with that? And he looked at me and he said, you know, I don't think we do, but maybe we can. And so we started brainstorming: what could we leave into the food distribution? Uh, packets into the boxes. What can we give the, the, the members or the, the community people that might last a little bit longer than the food, that might give them the food um, for the soul, as it were? And so we, we came up with, I came up with the three booklets that you're looking at. The first one is called Home for the Holidays. And Home for the Holidays is a a devotion booklet that's produced by Lutheran Hour Ministries that was written specifically to share the the, the, the story of uh, Christmas and the birth, and it, it's it's printable free. Uh, you can just download it off the internet, and it's customizable. You can put your church's information in it, and it it talks about the um, it talks about the word. It talks about baptism. It talks about sacraments. It talks about church family. It's something that's seasonal because it's designed specifically for this time of year, but it's also something that's a little evergreen in the sense that it can continue on with the sacraments. And another booklet then um, that is that was produced by Lutheran Hour is called What is Christmas? Uh, and that's the one that's in the middle there that you see. And it provides insights of the, the, 
the booklet's designed around a story of, of a family, and the family's going through all kinds of problems at the holidays and the celebration of Christmas. Uh, probably not unlike all of our families. Um, I, I apologize for the quality of my voice. Uh, my wife developed a cold slash flu type thing uh, last Monday, and she decided that she wanted to give it to me on Tuesday. So we went to the doctors yesterday, and uh, so I'm on the, she's on the medication. I just get the the, the fluids and, and go to bed type story. So she shared that with me. So what that did then is put us all behind in all of the celebrations because we have kids coming for Thanksgiving. We got to get the, the the presents done. So we're like three days behind. That causes a lot of angst. That causes a lot of nerves. Every family is going through this at the holiday. And so this booklet then takes those those incidences of a family that's, that's having some issues and problems with Christmas and then putting the Christmas story behind it. And the last one that we have, Amy, if you can click two more times. There you go. It's called The Christmas Journey. Uh, the Christmas Journey is a very small book, and it was written specifically for children. <coughs> we go backwards one more, please. Anyway, the Christmas Journey is available at, um, you get 25 other booklets for $6. And it's the story of Christmas from the the announcement of the angel all the way to the visitation of the Magi. And it's told in four line rhymes. Um, so every every part of the story is a little four line rhyme, which is great to read to children, for children to read to themselves, read along. As I was discussing this food distribution with the pastor, he, he looked at that, I had a sample of it there, and he looked at it and he says, that's the one that we're gonna use. That's the one that shares the Christmas story but it's it's it shares it in a way where the parents can share it with the children, the children can share it with other children, and it's written so that everybody can understand it. And then he looked at me and he, he got kind of an interesting look on his face. He said, "You know, we do a children's Christmas service, and we have, we still do the the gift bags, the the candies and the nuts and the oranges and like that." And I said, yeah, I'm, I've been to churches that do that. And he said, you know what? We're going to get this Christmas journey booklet, and we're going to put it in that bag. And so after they do the distribution of the bags to the to the children of the service, you know, that's that's kind of how you do it. You, you have the kids stay, and then they all get their bag. But then you ask for the congregation, you know, if the, the, anybody in the congregation has children, they get a bag too. And he says, we get a lot of people from the congregation to come in. And we're able then to distribute the the um, Christmas booklet then with it. So, having said all of that, um, it's not a definitive list. The whole purpose of this is basically to give you at least one idea, encourage you in what you're doing, because I know that you're doing a lot of outreach right now. Encourage you to do something that involves the community to share the love of Jesus, because you may not have it next day. I see we have one comment here on the three media, which do you consider the most effective, Facebook, website, or text messaging? Um, that's a great question, um, and it all depends on how you want to define effective. If you're speaking about um, the website as designed to reach to your members, that's the most effective because the members are used to going to the website. They're used to that's the church's present. Facebook is a social media that's designed to reach not just your members but also beyond it. So if you're trying to share the gospel beyond your your congregation, then Facebook would be the most effective. And uh, let's see, the most of the Facebook website or text messaging. Text messaging is very very effective, but it's a single use. Um, it, it's designed, if you want to get a lot of people at one place at one time, then you send out a mass text. Uh, for example, um, when I fell in Germany, uh, my wife needed to tell everybody um, that, you know, all the family that I, had, that I had, had suffered an injury. And so she put it on Facebook, and only a couple people saw that. 
but she sent a text, a mass text, to all of the children, and they all got it like immediately. So the effectiveness is designed, is, is measured in who's the audience that you're trying to reach. If I were a congregation and I just wanted to make a general announcement uh, to the community about what I was going to do, I'd probably put it on my website and use Facebook. If I wanted to mobilize my members, I'd use text messaging. If I just wanted to share a gospel message, I would certainly use it on Facebook. That's, I think that's the question I got, so I don't know if there's any more. Oh, that's very good. If anybody does have a question, please type that in there. I uh, just uh, I love Rich your your sense of of urgency uh, that you mentioned. Uh, there there may not be another day, so get out there and do that. I I certainly appreciate appreciate that message. And uh, we give thanks to God that you are uh, mended enough that you could be with us today. I I can't use this shoulder, but uh, I can use this mouth. So life is good. Thanks be to God that He gave you that. Uh, and I love that the, the whole idea of urgency, but not a not a Walmart. Uh, let's start selling stuff before uh, Halloween, but but an urgency that lasts all year round to share that love of Jesus. And, and just by the way, I don't have this. Uh, I don't have the authority to to say this, but I, I I'm just guessing. You don't lose your whole man card for a Pinterest account. Just a couple corners off it. <laughs> No, you lose the whole thing. Trust me, uh, I've lost it a bunch of times. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh well. For, for two dollars and fifty cents, I can buy fifty more. So life is good. Okay, good deal. Good deal. I, I don't see any more questions, but I do have a, a word of encouragement. Uh, you gave us some really fantastic, uh, uh, wonderful, practical ideas, and, and thank you for sharing some of those Lutheran Our Ministry resources. I have used every single one of those at some point in my ministry in rural small towns, and they have all been absolutely fantastic. Uh, but I wanted to mention one of the big things we hear an awful lot is, well, we're just not big enough to do all of these things, and, and we don't have enough manpower. And I encourage folks, regardless of what you're doing, you had mentioned, Rich, uh, that you brought in the community members. Don't be afraid to, uh, to invite community members to be a part of something like that Christmas concert. Look to other congregations as well. One of the greatest things we did in Cole Camp was uh, we got different groups in our different congregations work together on something, and then we did it two or three times. I also, uh, there was a congregation in Cole Camp, Missouri, uh, under 100 in their membership, a uh, little country congregation called Mount Holda, and every other year they put on a live nativity, and it was a drive through and you could come in on the highway uh, turn off on a gravel road, and there were there were tail lights as far as you could see, wanting to get through that. And of course, things uh, things going on in the in the church itself as you got to the end of it. So it, you can do it. If you can if you can dream it up, you can do it. Just just ask for help. I see Lynn mention an, uh, an additional idea. She said last year we started making Christmas for our Christmas tree. Got a lot of involvement, young and old. What do you think of that, Rich? That is really a fantastic idea, and when I was principal, uh, we, our, my eighth grade class made Christmas for the tree, and then we, we put it on the Christmas tree, and then later on, after Christmas, then we distributed the, the Christmas to the people, the shut-ins, and then uh, people in the nursing home. We would take them out there, and we would give them the Christmas that were on the tree that the kids had made, and then we'd give them to the people in the nursing home and share the story of Christmas. And you could do that. I mean, we did it like Easter. Uh, and so then every year, and I know uh, later on it was to, to the point where it was not effective to do it every year, but that the Christmas are a great storytelling piece, and they're, and they're really beautiful. I mean, the other thing that we did is we had the sin and the grace tree where you have the red lights and you have the white lights, and it's, you know what a visual that is. Uh, especially for the young ones, but yeah, it's a tremendous, it's a tremendous idea. It's it's simple to do, beautiful symbols, and you know they make they make good presents too. Oh, and opened us up an opportunity to talk about what that symbol means because most people maybe haven't seen those. Absolutely, I don't see. Yeah, I don't see any other questions. Uh, so, uh, Rich, thank you so much for your information today. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, just to give you all a little update on what's going on in the, the world of LCMS Rural and Small Town Mission, 
coming up January 17th through the 18th, we will be holding our first national mission, uh, 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 <laughs> excuse me, um, uh, our, our national uh, mission event, uh, which is uh, going on in uh, in Concordia, Missouri, and we're inviting folks in. It'll be a good practical thing. Don't they know we're here? Practical engagement, partnerships, home missions. And, and so this national mission festival we're holding in, in conjunction with St. Paul Lutheran Church's 175th anniversary. So that's very exciting. We got people coming in from all over the country and you can celebrate and and we'll eat and feast together and, and have a good time. Also, some upcoming events. The 11th of December, we have Reverend David Johnson, who will be talking about some church planning ideas. He's a, a mission developer up in Decker, Minnesota. January 22nd, Mark and Chris will talk about Don't They Know We're Here? And uh, I will be talking about building partnerships between congregations on the 19th of February. So those are the things coming up. Watch our website, watch our Facebook page, and, and we're not texting everybody yet, but uh, we sure send out a lot of messages. So a lot going on. We give thanks to God for this wonderful opportunity we have in this season to uh, to reach out and, and to know the story, to tell the story, and to share the story. Again, thank you, Rich Corey. God's blessings to all of you in, in, this, uh, in, in this upcoming season of Advent and as we move forward to celebrate the glorious gift that is Christmas. God bless.